a lot of these companies that I've seen, they're going back to the old school way of approvals. Do you want to spin up another bucket? You have to get approval. Do you want to spin up EC2? Or they're putting quotas down to a department level, down to a, a group level that's saying you get to spend a thousand dollars a day. And if not, you have to go above that. I think that's going to be the next thing that we're going to see. Probably Amazon's going to put in or some really cool third party. That's what I love about this country. Right? There's always another company coming up trying to solve something that's going to go through approval process. And I think that's going to be the next the next step is you have to put barriers or, or gates into this because you have literally unlimited amount of spend that you can do. And there's no concept of putting, and it's at the end of the month, like, oh, I just spent $90,000 of egress costs. How did I do that? Uh-oh. Hi, this is Yosef Bhartia, and welcome to another episode of Topic of This Month. The topic of this month is cost optimization. And today we have with us Tom Nats, Director of Customer Solutions at Starburst. Tom, it's great to have you on the show. Great. Thanks for having me. We have hosted Starburst earlier, so our audience, they are aware of you folks. But it's a good idea to just remind them quickly before we deep dive into today's topic. What is Starburst all about? I think it was uh, like a data lake platform. Uh, we were born out of Facebook about 12, 13 years ago as a query engine against Hadoop. And over the years, we've added a bunch of connectors and really, really focus on uh, analytics in the data lake for you know any of the clouds or on-prem as well. So, And since, you know, uh, we are talking to Starburst, the focus will be more on looking at cost optimization for data lakes. So it will be a more focused than a general purpose, but I do want to talk a bit about a broader topic, which is like, if you look at cost cutting, you know, because uh, the market is changing, even we were thinking in 2024, things will settle down, but we are seeing layoffs, teams are getting smaller, but we are also looking at not just cost cutting, but also becoming more cost efficient, cost optimization. Talk a bit about when it comes to cost cutting, is data, data infrastructure, data lakes, they come under chopping block, or this is one area where you see that, hey, you know what, cost cutting does not affect this area? Um, I think it's just starting to come around now. Um, I, I worked at a, a sports uh, company many, many years ago, and we had a director come in, and the first thing he does, we have, you know, 100, it was 190 micro strategy reports. And he said, okay, what are we using? And it turned out to be like 24 of those were actually being used. So we're starting to see this now, especially on the cloud where everything was more application focused. People were trying to save money there. Now people are starting to say, okay, why are we, you know, why are we a hundred thousand dollars a month for our S3 buckets? Like uh, it was the idea is what S3 and, and its object stores were cheap and now they're not becoming cheap anymore. So I think people are starting to focus. And I think what's caught up is the tooling. The tooling is finally there. You could see, I always go to AWS reInvent and I, and I do my own little uh, survey of those companies. And now I'm starting to see, obviously security is big, but we're starting to see a lot of audit companies that are appearing to try to help you save money, not only just on your applications, but on data lakes. Can you also draw a comparison between when it comes to like cost, you know, cost cutting versus cost optimization? Are these two different things? Of course, whenever new folks come in or there is a merger acquisition, you know, a lot of, you know, Things happen, you know, but uh, let's forget about, you know, looking at shareholders' interest, you know, and all those things uh, from becoming a more efficient company. Uh, talk a bit about cost cutting versus cost optimization. Is there any difference or they are the two faces of the same coin? I, I think they're yeah, complete opposites. I think cost cutting is, are we using this yes or no? What is the importance of it and what is the cost benefit of it? That's cost cutting. What we're finally starting to see in data lakes is the cost optimization where you take a table format uh, called Apache Iceberg that takes a different approach at when you're querying or looking at data in a lake. It's basically keeping a dictionary and looking at the dictionary first or like a card catalog, like in the old libraries where you used to go, you have a card catalog, first you go there and then you go to only where the books that you need are. That's what we're seeing is like something like Apache Iceberg where now you're starting to cut down on costs from the cloud because before you were just looking at, you're going through every row in the library and you're like, that's expensive. And then now I'm only, I only need to, it's, it's just, you're just giving the cloud more and more money. So we're starting to finally see some technologies that are coming out to the data lakes that are uh, doing a cost optimization and people are saving a, a tremendous amount of money with these new technologies. So that's pretty exciting. That's just within the last year. The way we build deploy application, we, the way we leverage data, is that kind of, 
increasing the cost of data infrastructure that companies are trying to tame, or we are simply looking at cutting the cost. So my question is that, are you seeing any patter patterns where you're seeing that, hey, these are some of the leading cause causes of cost increase when it comes to data infra infrastructure? Yeah, I think, you know, back in, uh, I come from the, the Oracle and Teradata days where you had a, um, you only had a certain amount of space and a certain amount of processing nodes. And in order to increase that, you had to go do a, usually a 10 month acquisition. You have to go get it approved. And so you had to make do with what you had. And I think everybody has rushed into the cloud where just throw it all out there. And we used to have this, what we call raw or staging area. And that would have to be maintained because that was only so large. Now what we're seeing is it's unlimited. And so you're just keeping everything. And what really got it to me, we were, I was logged in and I was screen sharing with a very large customer the other day. And and they were going through each of their buckets, their their storage buckets, and I could not believe their monthly spend. And it was just no big deal to them. And I'm like, you could buy a storage area network for every month that you're doing that. So I think I think that hasn't quite caught up yet. I think it's more of like all the, like I said before, all the applications, that kind of stuff people are, are looking at. I think the next, in the next one or two years, I think people are gonna start saying, okay, what's the point? Why are we spending so much money on our data analytics in the cloud? It was supposed to be cheap. It was supposed to be spin stuff up, elastic. Uh, what would I call a cloud pattern? And that's not what you're seeing. People are leaving services up 24 hours a day, even if they're not using it. That's not what those cloud providers were ever meant for. And so I think now we're starting, we saw security catch up. We're seeing cost, cost optimization on the application side. And I believe the next two years, we're going to start seeing that's going to be the next cost cutting. Do you need this report? Do you need this data? When we look at cost, it doesn't matter whether we are looking at data infrastructure or other areas. There are certain costs which increase, which is expected, but then there are some unexpected costs. So if we can just kind of, you know, summarize it that, hey, you know what? These are expected costs which are growing, you know, and they are expected to grow. But then there are a lot of unexpected costs that will you know, pile up. If yes, what are those? Yep, yep. A good example is, you know, um, you, you go sit, spend, you know, stop at the store, you buy this, buy this, buy this, and they're, they're really small things, but they all add up. Um, a great example is my brother uh, is an AWS consultant, and he found uh, uh, something that was running for four years. And the entire cost for the four years was $390,000. And what it was, it was an application that was just every second was spitting out a log. And inside the log was the word null. And that was, that the problem with that is nobody would ever call it. He just happened to come across that. And you start to look at all these little small things that people don't, don't see. Um, especially if you start to look at, we, uh, a customer showed me their S3 bill for the, for the month. And it was $21,000. $7,000 was just the storage cost. All the other one was accessing the storage and people are just thinking like, oh, it's seven thousand dollars of storage in their mind. They're thinking it's twenty one thousand dollars. That's how much I pay for storage. Well, it's not. It's the usage of it. So all that usage is did you really need to run this report? You know, so the stuff that we didn't have to worry about on prem because you had a limited amount of resources that you can only beat up so much. Now it's unlimited. And that is, to me, is like way more of a scary. And you're starting to see like every week there's a new article that comes off. It's like the great cloud exit. I don't think that'll ever happen. But I think companies are starting to say, okay, let's look at some of these third-party data, data centers. Um, can I move some of these workloads to those that are static versus use the cloud for what it was made for? So that's what I'm starting to see is like people's taking a step back and saying, okay, let's really look at what we're doing here. That's only certain companies. Certain companies are just full steam ahead, right? But we'll start to see this uh, as you know, you start to see more and more publications on it. What are customers doing to mitigate some of these costs to become more cost efficient? You know, nobody wants to hear this, but a lot of these companies that I've seen, they're going back to the old school way of approvals. Do you want to spin up another bucket? You have to get approval. Do you want to spin up EC2? Or they're putting quotas down to a department level, down to a group level that's saying you get to spend $1,000 a day and if not, you have to go above that. I think that's going to be the next thing that we're going to see. Probably Amazon's going to put in or some really cool third party. That's what I love about this country. Right? There's always another company coming up trying to solve something that's going to go through approval process. And I think that's going to be the next the next step is you have to put barriers or, or gates into this because you have literally unlimited amount of spend that you can do. And there's no concept of putting, and it's at the end of the month, like, oh, I just spent $90,000 at egress costs. How did I do that? Uh-oh. I've seen that. So many times over the last three years, like, uh-oh, 
but it's just like somehow you have to absorb it. But at a certain point, you, you just can't pay for that anymore. So I think that's the next part is you're going to have to put approval processes and all this stuff because it's completely out of control. What kind of tools are available for users so that once again, you know, they don't have to do a lot of things manually. You said, you know, that they are going back to the old process of approval, but I don't see that to be very productive. Uh, we live in an automation where we are going to leverage a lot of Gen AI also, but are there tools available that can help with taming some of these costs that are going out of control? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, use the cloud for good, not evil. Um, I think like we have a product called Starburst Enterprise that is the cloud based and you'll be able to spin up clusters. And the way it, the hard part is dealing with companies that were on-prem and they had like a Teradata cluster. And then they bring it to the cloud and they're like, okay, I have a cluster. We're like, no, no, you don't need to think. You have another dimension that you can think. You can have multiple clusters. Now you can start thinking, okay, now I can really do chargeback to my departments. That department gets their own cluster. They can do whatever they want. They have their own budget. They want to spend a million dollars, they can. So I think that's the big difference what the cloud gives you when it's used the right way is... is um being able to split those those costs up to those departments. And then now you can see, wow, um, the, the good example I give is we have a company that has like 40 reports that they they run at eight o'clock in the morning. They have their own dedicated cluster for it. It's a suspend mode all, all night. And it means they're not paying for it, which is a cloud pattern. It spins up, it runs those 40 reports and it stops. And at the end of the month, they get to see how much those 40 reports cost. That's never been available in my career. They're like, okay, this is costing $5,000 a month. Do we really need those 40 reports? Maybe we just need 20 of those reports. So that really starts, if you split cost out more, you st it's like going through the old, we used to like balance my checkbook. Well, my parents did, not me, right? It's trying to figure out, okay, we, you know, my parents at the end of the, at the month where they would go through the checkbook and say, what did we spend upon? Like, and I think that's starting to, like, people are starting to, this is what the cloud is for. Spin it up, spin it down, only use it when you're, when you're actually using it. And then from there, do audits, do internal audits. Like, what? Do, uh, how much did we spend last year? I think people just get so fast into it where they're like, oh, and then it's too late. Like, we spent way too much money. Now it's going to take four months out of our time to go through all these resources that we've spent up, all this storage and that kind of stuff. Even us as a software company, we're, you know, nobody wants to say that we're out of control. Like, we're trying to constantly audit what people are spending up. And we're just a software company. Imagine a big enterprise company that's got to just be overwhelming, so. One thing more that I want to talk to you about, when we do talk about cloud, there is no single cloud, you know, that clouds, you know, public cloud, private cloud, your own data centers, then we are talking about edge as well. Multi-cloud is a big story where you're running workloads depending on which service you want. Can you also talk about, uh, from the perspective of cost, cost optimization, can this whole multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, help there or it actually increases the cost to me it's mostly increased the cost it seems to be um a good example i have is a customer the other day they have all their analytics on google for their websites they have a bunch of websites out there and their main cloud is aws so they were spending sixty thousand dollars a month sending that data to aws and i would just fell off my chair almost i was like and they were that was just the norm and i'm like oh my gosh like that that we got to that point where um, these clouds have their monopoly, not monopolies, and they're um, commoditizing. So they're commoditized, but they don't want to be commoditized because uh, it's the same kind of services that you can mostly get on AWS, you can get on Azure. And so now it's almost like this lock-in and they make money off the egress or they're locking you in through this egress cost, uh, pushing data to one cloud to another. So we're really trying to focus on, okay, does my data need to leave this cloud? If it does, then does all this data need to leave? Can I aggregate this data? Let's ask, um, <clears throat> what, let's figure out the least amount of data I need to move from cloud to cloud. I think that's the next thing that, that we're looking at. We have something called Stargate, which is basically put these clusters in these clouds, do that aggregation first and only send over the data that you need. I think that's gonna be the next thing. How do I optimize the data before I start sending data and start figuring out how to like, um, get a different cost with with this cloud. Let's figure out the minimum amount of data I need to move. And do I really need to move? Can I move the data the other way around? So that's the kind of thing is like I talked about before, there's going to be some automation and tooling around this. Like what is the biggest pain for some of these customers are, are those costs? Well, let's figure out what kind of tooling we need to make sure this doesn't, you know, to reduce those costs greatly. So since we're talking about cross cloud cost, 
uh, what kind of trend you are seeing or what kind of pattern you see may emerge to tame these you know spendings and cost if you look at a couple of years ago the clouds really got into this edge computing and now they've all pulled back i think azure finally shut that down uh, amazon didn't go anywhere I think that's going to be a resurgence again, where you're actually developing or, or generating that data to drag that all the way to some central place. That's a long way to go. If you could do some micro aggregations there and that type of stuff, I, I still go back to my old days at the sports company I was talking about where we had this big I-series and a bunch of these places had I-series. And I learned after two years, we were pulling all this data out into Teradata, doing all this ETL, doing all this micro strategy stuff when... This guy showed me this flat, something called a flash report in, a, in an iSeries and it ran in like eight seconds and it told me the sales from yesterday and last year. And I was like, it's right there. That was to me like that was the edge was the iSeries. We went through this six hour process to pull all this data out and do all the stuff with it. That was great. But the main core things, what the questions am I trying to ask of the data? I'm able to be able to ask right on the edge when it's coming out and save a bunch of time and latency dragging this all this data all the way to some central repository. One more big topic that we did not touch upon, which is generative AI. Uh, what impact do you see of generative AI on cost? Or we can look at it from other lens as uh, impact of cost on generative AI adoption. Um, yeah, I think it goes both ways. I think it's going to be a great tool for us uh, to be able to look at, okay, what is the spend that we have now? go through everything and go through my last 12 months are the things I'm not using, go through all my logs, do all that kind of stuff. Instead of me trying to do it myself, it's uh, there's going to be some models out there that are just like an AWS model or an Azure model that, okay, connect this, 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 and it's going to come back with a bunch of recommendations. I think that's the main thing. But the other part too, it's like, I have a friend that works at an, uh, another very large software company and said, um, this is very, very expensive. What we're trying to do, all these models that all these services that we're offering, it's costing these companies a lot of money and they're not getting a lot of value add for it right now. So I think it's an investment by them that they see. But we saw this a lot with the data science. People went and hired all these very expensive data scientists and they said, okay, we'll be able to double our revenue. When that never turned out, they're like, okay, let's take a step back and figure out maybe we just need two or three data scientists and we'll see what the ROI on that is. So I think that's what we're seeing is like, just like everybody jumps and buys an Apple phone or the new headset thing they have, right? There's always going to be those people jumping into that. But I think people are starting to sit back and say, okay, let's just take a break. Let's just not jump in right away. Maybe we could do some experimentations, but let's see what everybody else is doing. And let's wait for the early adoption to be done. And then let's figure out the best way to to spend our resources and time. So, Tom, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this topic. And as usual, I would love to have you folks back on the show. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.